So John Para is an award-winning illustrator, designer, teacher, and painter. I believe this is his third book he has illustrated with author Monica Brown. This one is about the artist Frida Kahlo, not, but not exactly about her art. As you can tell from the title, it's about Frida and all of her animalitos. A parrot, an eagle, a fawn, two monkeys, two turkeys, three dogs, and a black cat. We also learn about the many difficulties and illnesses Frida Kahlo had in her life. This sweet story about the way Frida's animals helped her get through her troubles is made even better because of John Parra's illustrations. Personally, I believe Frida Kahlo would love John's artwork as much as I do. So please help me welcome to Gaithersburg, John Parra. Hello, good afternoon. Are we in the afternoon already? I think so. Uh, it's an honor to be back here at Gaithersburg uh, Book Festival. Um, again, the first time I came, it was also raining, so I guess I'm getting used to this now. Uh, I hope you guys are dry and enjoying yourself. Uh, there are many wonderful authors and illustrators here today, and it's just to be an honor to be among uh, one of them. Um, so today, I'm um, gonna be talking about three books, actually, but focusing mostly on the Frida Kahlo book, which is my most recent one as well as some other uh, projects that I've done. So hopefully I'll just share a little bit of those with you as well. To start with, I'm gonna talk about how I kind of became an illustrator. Um, because when I was younger, I, even though I loved to do art all my life, uh, I didn't know I was gonna become a professional illustrator until I was around 20, to be honest. Um, and it wasn't until a professional illustrator came to my school, into my classroom, and talked to us about art that uh, that's when the switch, when the light bulbs went off and fireworks went off in my head, and that's when I really decided that's what I want to do. This is what I really want to do. So having that experience to meet authors and illustrators is so important for young people as well to see what's possible, what's potential. So again, I'm just going to go over um, a little bit of my background and beginning. Uh, we're going to start with my early years. I have a little presentation over here. Uh, maybe I can kind of get a little closer. Uh. Uh, this is me uh, when I was a little baby. That giant head right there is, uh, is uh, back in 1972 um, when I was born. Uh, yeah, when I was born, the first thing the doctor said was like, God, this kid has a huge head. Um, it hasn't changed, so uh, large, large gradient. Um, and where I grew up, I grew up in, uh, in Southern California. And um, where we lived, we had 50 avocado trees my dad planted. Um, and uh, we ate like avocados for breakfast, lunch, and dinner pretty much all the time. So this was, uh, this was me and one of the avocado trees that he just planted. And why I kind of also, my parents were kind of multicultural family. Uh, my father was Mexican and my mother is American. And um, my mother was a school teacher for more than 30 years. And she really introduced me to a lot of books as a young child. She took us to the libraries and many different places. And my father, my father was like an amateur artist. Uh, he didn't really get to become, you know, an artist himself or pursue it as well because he was taken actually out of school to become a, he was basically a farm worker in California growing up, and that was his life. Uh, interesting side note, my mom also used to be a Catholic nun um, as well when she was a teacher. So that's her in her habit. She was a Catholic nun for about 15 years, and that's my dad also on the side there. He was uh, in the Army. Uh, he went to Fort Ord, and uh, he got to travel around then. Um, this is my, I grew up mostly on my father's side of the family, so these are my grandparents. Uh, this is their home in uh, Bakersfield in California. Uh, they were both from Mexico, um, and I really, I just really got close to that side of the family. So the food, uh, the culture, that's how I kind of grew up. Uh, so that's what really inspired me when I got older, because a lot of my books have to do with la Latino culture. Um, one of my favorite places to go to, my mom used to take us to as kids, was like the Natural History Museum. Does anybody know what bones these are up here? Can we, can we see the bones on the screen? What kind of bones do we, do we know? Over here? Over here? Any, any guesses? They look like whale bones. Those are whale bones right there. So that's like a big, you know, that's a big animal, right? The whales. So we used to love going to the Nat Natural History Museum. We also loved going to the Art Museum as a kid. Even as very young, my mom, she wasn't intimidated. She'd take us to the Art Museum, even though we'd have like the monkey giggles and laughing the whole way through. Uh, she'd still take us, you know. She wasn't, uh, 
She, <laughs> she wasn't uh, afraid to take us to there. And also where I grew up along the coast in California, um, I was born in Santa Barbara, and this is the town. You know, we used to also have a, an appreciation and love for nature. Um, so we used to enjoy the, the beaches and also uh, camping up in the mountains and things like that. So I really kind of developed all those things that early on uh, to develop, you know, a fascination for, for the nature and things. Also, a lot of public art. There was a lot of public art. This is a, this is a street painting festival that they have every year in uh, the town I grew up where they're actually drawing and painting right on the streets. Just amazing, incredible things. And then what's funny is like, it only lasts a few weeks, and then the rain comes and washes it away. So it's a really beautiful thing that's just sort of a temporary, sort of almost like art exhibition. So I, I was fascinated by that as a kid. Um, also, we celebrated Fiesta every year in our town, uh, celebrating our, our Latin heritage and culture with music, food, dance. Uh, anybody recognize any of these books? A few? A couple favorites, right? Well, when I was a kid, these were some of my favorite books. Um, again, as I said, my mother was an educator, and she used to love to read to us. And I think that's so important that we read to our kids um, when they're young and growing up. And it really doesn't stop, you know. Even when I was, like, almost adolescent, my mom would still talk about books to us, still say, hey, read this book, read this story, and things like that. And it really inspired me. Because when you read books, you really, your imagination just grows wildly. So while at the same time I was doing art, it was because of books that my imagination got even more creative and more interesting. So these were some of my favorite books growing up. Uh, and especially, I love the work of Virginia Lee Burton's work. Because uh, she used to do books about dinosaurs and tractors and caves and these little houses and landscapes. And I just thought they were the most beautiful and fascinating things uh, you can see. And as a young person, that's like your first introduction to art is through children's books. So I love creating books that today like that I can make as beautiful as I can because I know that could be the first time you're introducing a child to art, you know, and beautiful things. And I want, and I want kids to enjoy art and see beautiful things like that because I think they are naturally creative and want to do and do art. Uh, my very first day of school, I was in the newspaper. Um, I'm just going to read this real quick. It said, five-year-old Abraham Barraza and John Parra put their finishing touches on some self-portraits. When asked if his mother had given him any last-minute instructions prior to leaving for his first day of school, John Parra said, no, she didn't. I know it all already. <laughs> it was all downhill from there. No. But I just, again, I was always drawing. So I, like the very first day of school, I'm already like on the, in the newspaper drawing self-portraits. <laughs> this is probably the earliest drawing that I, uh, I have of uh, one of my, uh, when I was young. So this is probably 19, probably when I was like about six years old. Uh, I used to love drawing houses. Again, I used to love Virginia Lee Burton's, and I was inspired by her house, uh, the Little House um, book. Uh, so I wanted to draw my house and kind of make a, a little creative. And then I also had like a little fort in the back that, uh, and just the single flower, I don't know. Um, <laughs> My dad was a landscape contractor, so we always doing these little flower beds and things um, with that as well. And because I love to do art so much, my family knew that I loved it. So, and it's important. So when you have kids that are very artistic, you know, it was important that my family also encouraged me. That, so every birthday, I got markers and pens and pencils. And even though you know they just they just wanted to kind of they didn't know where I was going to end up later on, but I'm just, just to have that talent that they saw that I got excited to do art, they encouraged me. And that, was, that meant a lot to me growing up. Um, so I draw like little Jeeps and landscapes and waterfalls and uh, things like that. Even designed my own video game as a kid. Uh, this was the Donkey Kong video game I drew. And then pretty soon I got into anime and robots and characters like that. Uh, and then just other, I really just, I love landscapes. I love drawing. This was about castles and, and and different scenes. Um, and just a, well, then I got a little, yeah, older. I got a lot better when I started drawing some of these. So this was just before I started going to art school. I also worked for my dad, who was a landscape contractor. Uh, one of my favorite parts about working for my dad, sometimes I got to do his design works uh, to do for his landscape designs that he would pitch to the clients. And I was very young. I was only about 15. And I used to just love doing all the, the, the trees and plants. Um, and, you know, uh, measuring out the homes in the, in the space. So this is one of the designs I still had uh, for one of the homes. And again, because I love to do art, 
Uh, my teachers knew. Uh, some of my teachers really played a big important uh, factor in growing up and becoming an artist because it wasn't for them. You know, they really encouraged me. Again, as I mentioned before, it wasn't until I was like 20 that I decided to become a professional illustrator. And it was because of the help of teachers, wonderful, wonderful teachers, uh, especially some of my art teachers that really encouraged me and worked with me uh, to pursue that, that I, I continued going on with art. You know, I, I was like in junior college and I was just kept taking like math class or science class. And I kept saying, well, any, any, the next class I take will be my profession. I'll, I'll figure it out. But in the meantime, I'm going to just keep taking these art classes that I like so much. You know, not, not really fully thinking it through. You know, I was like, duh, John, that's it. That is what you're going to do. So it's kind of a funny thing. And eventually I did go to art school. This is Art Center in Pasadena. And then after that, soon after that, I moved to New York City. Is it going? Oh, my children's books. OK. So again, uh, after moving to New York City, I did lots of illustration projects for different clients and things like that. But most people, most people know me uh, from my children's books. And uh, these are some of my children's books that I have right now. Um, and I'm going to share three with you today. Uh, two just briefly, and then one I'm going to go in depth, which is the Frida Kahlo book. And all three of these books were written by author Monica Brown. So this is actually kind of like a, our um, trilogy book series, <laughs> we call it. Because they're all about, and it's funny because they're all about real life people. They're all biography books um, about real people. So the very, very first book I did was called My Name is Gabriella. And it had to do with a, a, a real life person. Her name was Gabriela Mistral. And she was from Chile. And she was a poet. And she grew up there, and she had big dreams as a young girl, um, always thinking about animals and, and nature and things like that. So I really, really kind of responded, connected right away to the story um, about her life and her dreams. And pretty soon she started writing her poetry and started traveling around the world. Uh, this is a picture of her when she went to Mexico and her when she went to New York. How many people have been uh, to New York and walked over the Brooklyn Bridge? Show of hands. Isn't that the most amazing thing ever? Especially on a really nice day. If you haven't been to New York and walked over the Brooklyn Bridge, I highly recommend it. Um, maybe get some ice cream uh, on the Brooklyn side. There's a really great ice cream shop. Uh, they, they know over here um, how wonderful it is as well. But it's a fun, fun thing to do. Um, and so this is, uh, again, this was about Gabriella Mistral. And she was so famous for her poetry, they actually gave her the Nobel Prize prize for literature. I think she was one of the first La Latina um, uh, recipients of the Nobel Prize for Literature for her poetry. Um, you might know this one. This one's called Waiting for the Biblioborum. Um, and it has to do with another real life person. His name was his name is uh, Luis Soriano. This is a picture of the real uh, Biblioboro. And um, he basically, he lives in Colombia. And he has these two donkeys in a library. So he basically loads up the two donkeys, his uh, animals, and he, uh, with children's books. And he goes out into the countryside, um, far, far remote areas, to places that uh, don't have libraries. And some of the kids there don't have even teachers. So he kind of he uh, fills that void. I mean, he really goes out um, and delivers books to those kids, you know. And he goes out and he reads to them. And so this is... But the story is told through the, the eyes of a little girl named Anna. So Anna is, a, is, a, is someone who loves books, but her teacher has left, and she's only left with one book. And until one day, the, the, Luis, uh, the Biblioboro comes to visit her village and shares all these books with Anna and her friends. And she gets so excited. She gets super excited. And she, again, also has big dreams. Um, about what she wants to do. And it's through the books and through her imagination that she thinks about her life. And it's sort of told in this sort of really fun, imaginative, uh, you know, fantastic way she's f that she has dreams almost flying through on the back of a butterfly, butterfly's back through her, through her country, overseas and villages and towns, uh, and that she's inspired to write her own story. And eventually she gives that story to, to the Biblioboro, and he takes it. And he gives it to other kids and to, in other villages. So I really like the message that uh, they talk about in this in this book about, you know, how education through learning through can be proactive and uh, elevate elevate anybody anybody, um, you know, in any circumstances. So I really enjoyed that that part of the story. 
All right, all right. So here we go. So Frida Kahlo and her animalitos. Uh, so this is, again, this is a, a, the, the third book I've, did, I've done with Monica Brown, author Monica Brown. And um, when I first was told about the book, I said, oh my gosh, another Frida book. <laughs> but I was thinking, but I, heard, I read about the story and, and the approach that Monica had, because it has to do with actually her animals. She had many different pets and animals um, when she was alive, and they really supported her in just this most, the most wonderful, fast, kind of interesting way that she has. And it really kind of touches on those things um, so well in the book. And if, it, if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to read uh, the, the book, Frida Kahlo and her Animalitos, to you guys. Um, just a little bit of background. So this is actually uh, a real picture. This is uh, the real Frida uh, with one of her pet monkeys um, at her house at La Casa Azul. Anybody know where La Casa Azul is? Where? Where do we, where's La Casa Azul? Mexico. Yes, good one. Thanks. <laughs> yes, La Casa Azul. So she lived, she was born in La Casa Azul, and actually she spent, uh, she traveled, you know, far, um, she lived in other areas, but eventually she returned to it. So she was both born and uh, lived the, re the end of her life also in La Casa Azul, part of her middle and end of her life. Uh, La Casa Azul. And uh, again, if you don't know Frida's artwork, she's amazing. She is wonderful. And she's basically known for her self-portraits. Uh, she did a lot of, she was like the original selfie uh, girl. <laughs> so, and she used to incorporate a lot of her animals in her pictures. So these are, many of her pets show up in her photo, in her paintings. Uh, so these are a few of hers as well. And um, and of course, at the bottom uh, right picture is her painting in bed, because uh, Frida also suffered a lot when she was alive. Uh, she had a lot of medical conditions and things like that. And the book talks a little bit about that and how actually how her animals and pets helped her through it. And of course, this is the real uh, museum, La Frida Kahlo Museum in uh, Mexico, uh, in Coyoacan. And anytime I start a book project, I wanted to see all the different pictures and all the different books that they have on the subject. And of course, Frida's got tons of books about her. So uh, that was one of, one of the wonderful things about working with it. There was no shortage of uh, reference materials and photographs. Um, her father was actually a photographer who worked for the Mexican government, uh, photo photographing uh, government buildings and things like that, but also taking portraits of their family growing up. So there's actually a lot of reference um, of her as a young girl. Okay, so we're going to begin. Frida Kahlo and her animalitos. And I'm going to go over here and read the story. Okay, got it. Hello? There we go. Okay. So, Frida Kahlo and her animalitos. Oh, wait. I need the. Does anybody have one in. I need an extra copy. English. English. Yeah, this one's Spanish. Hey, thanks. <laughs> okay, here we go. Make it easier. So Frida Kahlo and her Animalitos by Monica Brown, illustrated by this guy right here. Okay. This is a story of a little girl named Frida, who grew up to be one of the most famous painters of all time. Frida was special. This is also the story of two monkeys, a parrot, three dogs, an eagle, a black cat, and a fawn. They were Frida's pets, and they were special too. Frida had a parrot named Bonito. Like her parrot, Frida was colorful. She liked to wear bold shades that celebrated indigenous Mexico in her own heritage. She lived in a house the color of a parrot's bright blue feather, La Casa Azul, where she grew up with her mom, dad, and sisters. Frida had a pet fawn named Grainzo. Like her fawn, Frida had watchful, beautiful eyes. When Frida closed her eyes, she remembered her life as a little girl. Frida always was with her father, a photographer, who took her to the world, who taught her to look through the world at curious eyes. Frida and her father would walk to the park to collect bugs, to look at under a microscope. 
Frida's father also taught her to look at how to paint finishing touches on his photographs. Frida loved the small brushes and beautiful colors. Frida had a cat with black shiny fur, the same color as her dark hair. Like a cat, Frida was playful. But as a child, Frida couldn't always play. When Frida was six, she got very sick. She was in bed for a long time. But little Frida didn't get sad or bored. Instead, she used her breath to make mist on the window, and then she drew a door with her finger. Frida used her big imagination and curious eyes to walk out the door with the magic friend, a little girl who danced and played like a kitten. Frida was independent like a cat. Frida's sickness left one of her legs different from the other, and children made fun of her. But this didn't stop Frida from skating and riding bikes and rowing on the lakes of Chapultepec Park so that her leg could get stronger. Frida was not afraid to do things other little girls didn't usually do. She wore overalls and boxed and wrestled. Frida had two spider monkeys, Fulang Chang and Kameto de Guajabal. Like her monkeys, Frida could be mischievous, even when she was a teenager. When Frida was 15, she went to a school called Trapepatoria and found a group of friends she loved. Like Frida, her friends were curious to learn all they could. Together they read and studied and argued and sometimes got in trouble. Wearing matching caps, they rode donkeys through the halls of Preparatoria and set off firecrackers. Whew. Frida had an eagle named Gertrudis. Like her eagle, Frida's imagination could fly high. When Frida was 18, she was in a terrible accident, and once again, she had to be in bed for many months. This time, Frida didn't create a magic friend. She created art. Frida's mother made her a special easel and hung a mirror over her canopy bed so Frida could paint. Frida used her imagination and curious eyes to do just that. Feet, what do I need you for when I have wings to fly? And if those weren't enough pets, Frida had two turkeys and three dogs, Senor Sholto, Senorita Capolina, and Senora Costi. Frida's turkeys were intelligent and sensitive, just like herself. And like Frida, her dogs were warm and loving. When she was lonely or sad, she would wrap her arms around them, and they would comfort her. Her dogs were the same breed that ran and hunted with the Aztecs thousands of years ago, and a reflection of Frida's heritage, of which she was very proud. Frida's dogs had no hair, but their bodies were warm, and Frida gave them great big hugs whenever she felt lonely or sad. Frida's animalitos were spirited and entertaining, just like Frida. When her two spider monkeys were being good, Frida would hold them like babies. When they were being mischievous, they would steal socks and fruit and leap through the windows so no one would catch them. Her parrot, Nimbonito, liked to snuggle under the covers while Frida took naps and would do tricks at the dinner table for pats of butter. Frida's animalitos played all day in the courtyard of La Casa Azul, the bright blue house on London Street. Her husband, Diego Rivera, even made the animals a pyramid to climb on so that her pets could roam freely. When Frida painted, her pets would keep her company. And Frida painted all the time. While the birds sang, the dogs barked, and the turkeys danced in the garden. Frida's animals were her children, her friends, and her inspiration. Frida painted when she was sick and hurting, and Frida painted when she was happy. She also painted when Diego was gone and she was sad. But Frida was never really alone at La Casa Azul, the bright blue house on London Street. She had her animalitos and herself, and she painted both. 
Frida painted herself with Fu Lang Chang playing with ribbons. She painted herself with Bonito the parrot, Senor Shoto the dog. She painted her black hat too, peeking over her shoulder. Frida painted herself with all the pets she loved so much, and even butterflies and caterpillars. Her paintings were magic. And today, if you visit La Casa Zoo in Coyoacan, just outside of Mexico City, you might hear the sound of a bird or see a black cat jump from the pyramid that sits in the courtyard, the bright blue house on London Street where Frida and her animalitos lived so many years ago. Thank you very much. So these are all the paintings that I had to do for Frida. I have a question. How long do you think it takes me to do uh, one book such as this? So all those paintings, how long do you think it takes? Any, any takers? Six months, getting close? Huh? A year? Not quite a year. Almost. Nine months, about nine months. Uh, actually, it takes eight or nine months to do just one book because everything I do is by hand. All, everything is hand painted, and there's actually a, a quite an extensive setup um, that I'll kind of get into how I do the paintings uh, a little bit later on. So, um, what's really fun about doing children's books is I get to hide like all, all my friends and families and even pets uh, in my books. So this is our pet cat Lily. Uh, if you guys can see, and she's got her super cape on, uh, her super lily cape, and she showed up in our book, the Frida book. Uh, and this is uh, my book, At the Real, La Casa Azul in Mexico. Uh, my brother was kind enough to send me these pictures when he was there visiting recently, and uh, he put the, bo put the book uh, at the museum and took many pictures. Ideas. So often I get asked, how do you come up with ideas for books? Or how do you come up with ideas for drawings or paintings? Um, and I usually just have a sketchbook that I keep. And I start. I start with a little sketch. And something about that little drawing or sketch that I have uh, is interesting to me. So I'll kind of like work with that sketch. And I'll kind of develop it into like uh, more, dif more characters or add a setting to it. So the, the, so the, the couple in the, in the picture uh, kind of became that couple up in the top right there. And then sometimes I'll do a little color comp. So, and then after that, I might do like a little painting comp. And then eventually, it'll become the, the final painting. So there's all these little steps along the way. So if you want to start doing art, doing paintings, you know, just break it up into little pieces. So that way, you don't feel overwhelmed when you're doing work. Um, just start with a sketch and then kind of develop those ideas little by little. Um, also, if you like to do art or write, or play music or things like that. I also, one of my best teachers ever said, have a spot ready to go in your home that's just yours. Uh, because the, the, the biggest killer of inspiration is going to be procrastination. Uh, <laughs> so if you have everything out, if you have all your pens, your markers, your, you know, your computer ready to go to you know, write, or your music instrument out, um, it'll help you be more creative. Uh, because anything to get you going and um, uh, to start on being a to doing work uh, creatively um, right away. So that's what I have. So this is my studio in my house. Uh, I have my paints ready to go, computer ready, and um, it helps me It helps me right away. Um, influences. So I have loads and loads of art books at home. So just m basically my art is, bas is based on a lot of folk art, um, both Mexican and American, but also throughout the world because I find that folk art in many different places. You can go to like China or Africa and things, and you see art from local localities that I just find fascinating, and they really represent and feel connected to that community um, that I just respond to. So um, a, lot of, a lot of just picture images that I love, because I'm a fan just like anybody else of art. Uh, I love looking at art in children's books. I love looking at art in museums. Um, another big source of inspiration for me is my family. Um, I have uh, uh, my mom and my dad, my wife and uh, Sophie, uh, some pictures of them uh, who are here today, and cousins and uncles. So all of those people, also a big influence on my books, they sometimes show up in my books, uh, which is a lot of fun. Another inspiration is food, <laughs> which is great because I love food, and um, especially Mexican food. My aunts were really great cooks. They used to have a Mexican restaurant 
um, where I grew up in California, making uh, tamales and soups and, and things like this. Uh, so really one of the most wonderful things that's happened to me about um, that just came out about a year ago was one of my most fam uh, favorite projects I got to work on, which was stamps for the post office, um, and it have to do with food. So these are Six Forever stamps that I got to do, and um, it was a lot of fun because it combined food and art. And of course, they had this really wonderful presentation. Um, I flew out for, uh, my wife and I flew out for in, in New Mexico, and, um, and it actually even became a question on Jeopardy uh, just recently. I was eating, I swear, I was eating dinner at home, and I saw the question come up, and I just like almost spit everything out. I'm like, pop, 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 like this. I'm like, wow, they're doing a question about the stamps on Jeopardy, which is really interesting. Um, actually, there'll be another one on May 29th, if you're watching Jeopardy, um, about the Frida book. So keep your eyes posted for that one as well. Yeah, I know. There must be fans over there. Um, and if you like doing art, you know, I still continue to go to museums. I still go to do, uh, you know, literary art events. So if you love to do any of that stuff, I highly recommend it. This is a wonderful uh, book festival as well. I can, you know, just to support books and to art, uh, it's, it's immeasurable um, for your imagination and fun. Um, and again, having a lot of friends that are very creative as well. So that's one of the wonderful things about being a, a professional artist. I get to be friends with uh, other artists and other writers that are so creative, which is amazing, amazing. And we have a wonderful time and uh, eat lots of food together. And we still love going to the Natural History Museum. Uh, it's my granddaughter, Sophie. Can we say hi, Sophie? <laughs> that's her right there. She's a little shy right now. Um, Thank you. Let's see, how much time do we got right now? Because I do have one. Do we have a little? Do you want to see the painting techniques? Is anybody interested in that? I'll do that, and then we'll start drawing a little bit. Um, because sometimes people ask me how I actually do the paintings, because it's very textured. Um, I work on illustration board. Um, I usually tape off the edges, and then I gesso the illustration board. Uh, there's the gesso going down, and then I start layering up, uh, make a create a background that's kind of like this textured, worn out, uh, kind of like a shabby chic looking background. So I'll start with many different uh, layers of acrylic paint um, on the board, and just keep going, like maybe three, four layers, until, and then I take a, once that's dry, I get my sandpaper, I start sanding into it. Um, well, hold on. So then I get like a background. So then when, once I get the background nice textured, um, I'll start transferring the artwork down onto the board. And I do that. I make a copy. I print out the sketch. So this is from the Frida book, uh, one of the sketches. Uh, just a quick little background about the sketch. Actually, uh, this little design right down here um, actually had to do with one of Frida's own sketches that she had about that accident. So I kind of like how I you can incorporate uh, things from the artist into the, uh, into the book, and that's, that was one that I really liked, uh, kind of making that connection. Um, so this was it. So this was the, the background that I had, and I kind of put like a little blue kind of glow behind it, um, because I knew I wanted a kind of a darker background behind her. And then I start masking everything off, one by one. So all the little characters, and I start kind of like in the background of the sketches, like if there are characters behind, you have to start with that first, and then move yourself forward. So this is like there's a little cloud thing that behind, sits behind her face. And it kind of just keeps going. And then I start masking off again some more, adding the, uh, the train and bus uh, image. And then pretty soon the characters start coming in. So it's a little time consuming. <laughs> But it's, but it, again, every step along the way, it's just like one step, you know, and then you're just sort of building it together. Um, but it takes a long time just to do the one kind of thing. But I love it. I just, it's, it's just an enjoyable thing to do. So, and then you finally get to the final painting, which is that. Add it. The last part is all the detail and line work. The end. Okay. So that's the, the PowerPoint part of the presentation. I'm just going to move over here and do um, a little drawing. Um, how much time do we have? And then we'll do some questions. 15 minutes? OK, 15 minutes. So what I'd like to do, just real quickly. OK, we're going to do some. So we're going to do a drawing. So what we're going to do is we're going to do like a Frida. Is that, that's on. So we're going to do like a little Frida, uh, a, a Frida drawing. So we're going to do like a portrait, a uh, selfie. I guess I'll, I'll do me again. But we're going to do animals around it. So we're gonna, I need your guys' help uh, to help me. So we're going to pick out some of the animals. So, but we're, we're going to start with the face first. So I'm just going to do, what kind of head do I have? Big head. Big head. So we're going to do a big, big, giant head. Here's the bigger head. Little, little neck. Little, little neck. All right, so now what do we got? 
guy. We need some. We need some eyes. Does anybody know what eyes in Spanish is? Nose. And anybody in Spanish knows? Nariz. Nariz. That's right. All right. And what else? What else? Boca. Boca. Which is mouth, right? What's it? I runs in Spanish? Say hi. Yeah. All right, what are we missing here? We need, I can't hear you. What? Ears. Ears. Wait a minute, I'm forgetting something. What am I forgetting? Oh. And what's there? Some cheese in Spanish? Yeah. Okay, so now we need some help. Now I'm going to need some real help from you guys. What kind of animals we're going to put uh, in our portrait? Anybody? Uh, no, what about an animal? We need an animal. Pets. Cat. You want to do a cat? What other animals we're gonna have? Huh? Oh, we need a bird. Okay, let's do a blue bird up here. I was really inspired by Steve's bird. Kind of a funny bird. Anybody else? Any other birds or any other animals? Real? Huh? Spider? Yeah, I haven't done a spider yet. No spiders. Let's have them. Uh, let's do the web too, right? Let's do a web. Corner. I would like to get inspired by those who hang out in the corner. <laughs> Please remember. <laughs> Anybody else? Animals? Huh?
got one more, one more, and then we'll take some questions. All right. So one more. Anybody I haven't heard? Yes. What is it? portrait and some of our animals. Uh, I just want to say thanks. And um, any questions now? Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes. The masking? Yeah. It's just like masking tape. I just use, yeah, I just, I get the big super wide. I know you can use different kinds of, you know, uh, people have different kinds of materials that they use, but I just, it's easy. I pick it up uh, because I'm pretty hard on the 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 paint and you know I'm already scratching it anyway so I needed to kind of be a little bit stronger than some other materials that I use and I like to keep it kind of simple uh, as well so anybody else any questions yes right this is me well that was like a big thing in college I remember being in art school like you have to develop your style they kept hammering it home like you have to come up with your thing and I had no idea like what I wanted to do so I just like I've been trained you know all the way to be this f realist type painter art, art type person but it wasn't until like my final year that I decided I just fell in love with folk art I just love the style I love the the narrative kind of quality about it um, and that's that's what it was for me. So that combined with you know my family and, and everything like that, because also there's a big kind of folk art, Mexican folk art, like retablos. If you ever see retablos in Mexico, they're like they're, that's what it's like. I just love those types of those paintings, and um, so it's also what I like. It was hard to. I, I think it's a it's it it just takes years sometimes to figure that out you know how you develop it because it's also even though it is based on folk art it is my own style as well um, but so it's 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 all you know kind of grouped together in a weird way but it comes together eventually yes <laughs> what's my next part or which is the ones I've already finished <laughs> uh, I do have a book coming out this September called Hey Wall a story of uh, community and art it's about a little boy uh, who creates um, through through his community through his hearing stories about uh, family and friends and things like that in his, his neighborhood uh, he creates a mural um, in the wall that kind of it's a messed up mural and he kind of helps uh, they together they come together to put this mural on this wall um, so that's called Hay Wall, but they go, but it's also about just kind of growing up around the wall. It's interesting. So, uh, and then, uh, there's another, uh, book about, um, in a series that I did about green as a chili pepper, um, and uh, round as a tortilla. And then I did another one called, uh, this one's called one as a pinata. Uh, so it's a numbers book. Uh, and then I have <laughs> about two more after that. Uh, one I just turned in one, one is actually, I think it's already announced. So I can say it. It's about the little libraries. Uh, story. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the little libraries. So, um, so there's a story that has to do with uh, the creator of that, and also kind of where it goes from there. So it's a really wonderful um, kind of a story. I really liked it. I love, I love kind of. I'm always doing biography type books, but I like the stories that also are very uh, kind of uplifting and um, you know problem solving type, um, you know, um, thematically. So positive stories as well. So, so and then there's others, but I, I don't know if I can say those yet. It's a lot. <laughs> so, um, anybody else? Yeah. How long can I paint? Well, uh, I can paint for a long time, uh, I guess. So we're going to see. 
but um, I do have some help. Uh, my uh, granddaughter sometimes helps me out, actually, paint some of my paintings, and we have it make it fun. I think art should be fun. I mean, when you're doing art, I mean, that's why I'm doing it. I mean, it's just, it's just fun, and that's the way it, it really could, like, boil down to, you know, if you're not having fun, then I don't know. It's, to me, that's, that's, that's the kind of the point of it, and uh, just enjoying it. Not that it's, not e that it's easy. It's not easy, but it should be fun. So, anybody else? Yes. I do have the originals for this, yeah. Uh, you know, some projects you work on sometimes, like, like the stamp project, uh, the Smithsonian, they have a post office Smithsonian in uh, Washington, D.C., and they take all the art and all the sketches and all the reference material, and they put it, they keep it there, and they put it, like, in that, you ever saw that scene in, the last scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark in some, that <laughs> warehouse? It's probably like that, so it's, like, somewhere tucked in there. I don't know. Uh, no, but I, it's, this, so... Things like that, they'll keep the art. But I keep all the original art, and I'll have shows. I had a show, a big show last year in Virginia, uh, Farmville. Uh, I think I had over 100 paintings show that I was showing, and it was just a wonderful experience. And uh, and it's fun. You get to decorate your house and stuff like that. So, yeah. What's it like to make it in Uh, very little, actually. I don't really speak to the author when I'm working on a project. Um, the only reason I spoke to Monica on this project, the, the, because we've known each other for so many years, and I think we did a book festival in San Antonio, and uh, she was telling me about it. And she's saying, John, I, w I think this book could win all these awards, and like, no pressure at all. I was like, sure, okay. <laughs> I try to like filter that out and just sort of focus on the art. I don't no, I mean, I just do my best and whatever I can do that I think will like appropriately represent the story and you know the images as best I can. I, I don't know what happens necessarily afterwards. I'm not really th thinking of that. I just try to make the best book that I can and that's kind of like where I kind of want to stay. So, but yeah, we don't, uh, for most, uh, I was gonna say author illustrator relationships. Some, most of the time I don't speak with the author until after the book is done um, it's usually I'm working with art directors. Art directors will give me feedback. They'll, you know, they'll say, John, we need you to change this, do this, 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 this. I hardly ever, rarely will I ever speak to an author before uh, the book is even published. Um, so, and maybe not even meet them. Uh, Pat is the one person I have not yet met out of all the authors I've worked with. So it's kind of a weird. We, we had a couple closing, we close possibilities, but that's, um, yeah, still haven't gotten to meet her in person. And she's, We've communicated, but not uh, not actually face to face. So, thank you.